people have a right and a responsibility to balance, really, their individual needs, desires, and growth with the couple relationships, needs, desires, and growth. And I think sometimes that can get short shrift within couple therapy, as if the couple relationship is preeminent in all cases. And so the book is really coming out of this this problem of balancing these things, of fulfilling both. That was Dr. Daphne DeMarniff on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists committed to cutting-edge, integrative, and evidence-based strategies for living well. On this podcast, we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. I am Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. We hope this podcast offers you ideas for how to live a full and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Yael, I listened to your episode that we have for today on the rough patch, and I'll start by saying that I told my husband we're about to go record an introduction to an episode about midlife marital dissatisfaction. And he said to me, I have a lot of thoughts about that. (laughs) And I said to him, yes, let me count the ways in which this episode is relevant to us. Yes, we're all three women in our midlives in long-term committed relationships. And I think the rough patch can definitely describe uh, some aspects of of all of us and conversations we've had uh, off the air as well. And it's so nice for you, uh, Yael, to actually bring some of these conversations on the air because topics like uh, you know, sex, talking about uh, fantasy in a relationship, talking about the difference between privacy and your own private life and secrecy and some of the, you know, when are you crossing that line? All of those things were so helpful, I think, for me personally, but also thinking about actually a lot of people in my practice right now. I tend to have a lot of women in their, in their midlives and men in their midlives, and this is a topic that is constantly coming up. And people feel pretty alone in it. I love that it normalizes it, Yael. It's like, oh, I'm not the only one. Because I think in the movies and books that you read, they don't show this part of marriage. And it's nice to know. Yeah, I think that um, Dr. Daphne DeMarneff, um, her work in, in the book, The Rough Patch, is so relevant to me personally and professionally, just like you guys were talking about. And I love how she does normalize a lot of the glitches that we all run into in our long-term stable relationships. Um, and I'll just say, like as a pop culture reference, I'm currently obsessed with Kristen Bell and Dax Shepard because they're so out there with some of the foibles that they run into and with some of the messiness that comes and in relationships and and they're so much more honest about it than most public couples are Um, and I thought that Daphne DeMarneff um, in her conversation with me really brings a lot of the important issues that are really under discussed as you guys were referencing um, some of the challenges in sex, you know, as we age, as we get kind of bored with our partners, you know, this fantasy life that we have, crushes. Um, And so it was a really fun conversation. I hope everyone gets something out of it. Today, I am speaking with clinical psychologist, author, speaker, and couples therapy expert, Dr. Daphne DeMarneff, about her book, The Rough Patch, Marriage and the Art of Living Together. The Rough Patch offers a wise and optimistic approach to being married and married well, particularly in midlife. Dr. DeMarneff completed her graduate work at UC Berkeley, and her work has been published in academic journals, as well as in the popular press, including in the New York Times. She's also a contributing editor to Parents Magazine and writes a regular column on couples' relationships. And I actually discovered Dr. DeMarneff's writing when I picked up her previous book, Maternal Desire, a number of years ago and discovered the kind of writing and thinking that opens up your heart and mind in ways that can help you to develop grace, understanding, and skill in getting through the difficult challenges in life, including through parental and marital relationships. So I'm really delighted to have her here to discuss the rough patch. Welcome, Daphne. Oh, thank you for having me. So just to orient us, I wonder if you could start us off by describing how it is that you see the rough patch. 
The rough patch is a term that I use to describe a moment or a time in people's lives where they feel, they experience their individual growth and development as in conflict with their couple relationship. And sometimes uh, people, you know, people marry or they create intimate relationships, they build a life, they have jobs, they have children, they have houses. And at some point, they kind of look up, look around and say, wow, where am I? (laughs) What am I? And feel some sense of friction or conflict or constraint in developing and growing as themselves and discovering who they are within the structure of uh, their relationships. Yeah. Um, So, you know, I think we clearly all have rough patches in our relationships at various points, but you talk a lot about some of the rough patches and some of the specific issues that come up in the midlife of marriage. So sort of like after the first blush of romantic bloom has worn off and and we sort of get into, you know, just the ordinary life of being married, you know, when children come or financial stressors come or work challenges come up. And so it's, it's very relevant for me because I'm entering into my 40s as many of my friends are. And so I have some personal experience with some of midlife's various rough patches. And I wanted to share a quick anecdote from a friend who had this really poignant story. Um, As she was heading towards her 40th birthday, she was doing a lot of reflecting and she discovered a letter that her mother had written to her when she turned 20. And in this letter, her mother expressed how optimistic she was for my friend's future, saying that the world was her oyster, she could, she was at the, you know, at this point where she could choose any professional path, any personal path. Her life was just beginning and everything was possible. And now at almost 40, this was no longer the case. She had picked a professional path. She had two children and she had committed to her life partner. And there was nothing terribly wrong in her life. It just, as she expressed it, it just felt so final and so settled. And in your book, The Rough Patch, you talk a lot about the reckoning that most of us have to make as we arrive into midlife and how this impacts marriage. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about what you see as some of the central challenges of midlife as they impact marriage. Yeah, so so I'd like to just frame my answer to that question by starting with uh, the idea here that, that people have, um, I believe, a right and a responsibility to balance really their individual needs, desires, and growth with the couple relationships needs, desires, and growth. And I think sometimes that can get short shrift within couple therapy as if the couple relationship is preeminent in all cases. And so the book is really coming out of this this problem of balancing these things, of fulfilling both, and how complicated and fragile and and difficult that can be. And I really want to honor that because, you know, if you think of the era that we're all living in, you know, divorce is no longer stigmatized. There are many types of family arrangements. People start their families by being single parents. There is no uh, general consensus around the sort of religious uh, meaning of marriage. I mean, obviously, people have their own personal beliefs, but we're in a very fluid world. And we have very long lives, you know, you know, people's life expectancy is something like 30 years longer now than it was 100 years ago. So people aren't dying at 40 and leaving their marriages that way. You know, so in other words, there is a real need. And that's really what the book is trying to address to take seriously and honor the fact that over a long life, having a truly satisfying, intimate connection is a big challenge and takes a lot of skills and a lot of effort. So that's the context for the whole purpose of the book. And the basic argument is, okay, if you take that basic situation, right, that we tend to live longer lives, and we also have this ideal and aspiration toward intimate and deep uh, marriages, um, then what I argue is that, you know, I mean, and a lot's been written about this, but from a very many angles, Harville Hendricks has written about this, various other people. You know, we marry someone out of all sorts of conscious and unconscious reasons. And part of it is to solve and heal things from our own past or complete ourselves. And so once we do that and we have this wonderful, you know, falling in love phase and we feel like this is the answer to all our problems, 
of course, at a certain point, we have to deal with our inner baggage <laughs> that was not solved by this relationship. And so if you think about having built this whole structure of a life and, a, you know, with someone, there's going to be unresolved things within that you have not really fully dealt with or healed. And those are what emerge in this middle phase where the blush of love is no longer sort of carrying you through. And so what I say is this, this midpoint, this rough patch is this moment of recognition that all these things you've built, this structure, this life you've built with the other person is not going to solve these deeper issues. And that the solutions, if you will, are going to come out of having new emotional experiences that you may not be particularly equipped to have because of all your own stuff, right? So a lot of what we deal with in couple therapy is people come to these difficult problems that they have to figure out together with all sorts of dysfunctional emotional communication patterns that come from their past. They come by them honestly. And then here they are trying to get each other's attention or get some sort of soothing or get some sort of understanding and they, you know, bounce off each other and can't give that to each other. So th this rough patch moment is really about, you know, how are you going to develop more, develop differently, develop in some way that allows you to use the relationship as a grindstone of further individual development and growth and depth and intimacy and so forth. And that is a huge challenge. But it becomes very salient because as I say in the book, you know, when you're 40, you see mortality differently from when you were 20. You know, your friend's example is perfect because at 20, everything's open, right? At, at 40, you've made decisions that are already showing you life is limited. And yes, you may have another 40 years, but you can see the end in a different kind of way. And I hear people all the time, and probably you do too in your therapy office, who are genuinely grappling with, okay, I'm 45. I'm unhappy in my marriage, you know, is now the time to leave because, you know, I still have my attractiveness. I still have my vitality. I could actually have a real other life with somebody. I mean, they calculate this quite openly because it's really, um, they're very aware of the life course issues that are happening. And simultaneously, people are kind of like tortured with this idea of, if I if I put an end to this and I go look for something better, will I have just really um, followed a delusion? You know, maybe there is nothing better. Maybe, you know, I have to accept what I have. Maybe that is the sort of spiritual, ethical, psychological, emotional challenge here that I need to develop acceptance or resignation. Or they're thinking, is that somehow uh, self-destructive? You know, and those sorts of questions, which we deal with in therapy every day, are very much central to what I'm trying to talk about. Yeah. Well, and I think there's so much to unpack there because, you know, part of it is really the, the, the questioning that we have about like the meaning of life and what's possible. And I think earlier on in life, you know, in our teens and twenties, we don't worry so much about it because we figure, you know, we have all of life to figure it out. But at some point, you know, when we're stably married and living the life that we had, you know, built towards, we wonder like, is this it? Is, and is this enough? Should it be enough? Um, is it supposed to be enough? And it's kind of interesting from a historical per perspective. Historians have talked about marriage really having served various functions in the history of mankind. You know, it used to be more for protective purposes and there was a real division of labor and we didn't look to our partners for friendship or sexual gratification. It was really um, a religious institution, you know, for some time. And now we really expect a lot from our marriage. We expect it to be sort of the, the, the platform from which we get um, self-fulfillment and professional support and deep friendship and sexual gratification. And at, at some point, I think, you know, and certainly midlife is a time where we question, like, is it enough? Are we getting enough? And because we expect so much from it, I think a lot of those questions can become very, very uh, poignant and, and painful it, because for the most part, it's hard to sort of get everything we want from one relationship and, and there's so much pressure on it. For most people, we expect a lot more from it than we necessarily give to it because there's this myth that if it's the right relationship, it should just kind of offer those things. And I think in midlife, we really start grappling with um, what it is that is reasonable to expect and what it is that we can and should be giving to it. I think there is this idea that this should be less work. You know, it should be more effortless, that that is the proof 
that we're compatible or that this relationship makes sense. And it's always really this balancing act because I, I mean, as, as you were just alluding to, we are in this cultural moment and you and I are kind of technicians in this cultural moment to help people do the thing that people want for marriage, which is have these deep, intimate relationships, even in the warp and woof of family life and all the craziness work and everything else. So here we are helping people to develop the skills and the capacity to sort of have these things that they want, you know, but I mean, I think that part of that is understanding that, you know, self-development isn't easy. <laughs> you know, I mean, there is this kind of feeling like, oh, marriage shouldn't be this much work. If it's this much work, I shouldn't have to do it. And actually solving problems in relationships is messy and complicated and hard. And I sort of try to encourage people um, to, to sort of to understand that and that the, 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 the good marriage is one where you can do this hard stuff um, and, and uh, you know, slog through these difficult conflicts because that is what's going to help you deepen it um but you know not always not always easy to 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 convince people of that yeah yeah it kind of reminds me of um pamela druckerman who's one of my favorite writers came out with this book fairly recently called there are no grown-ups that's about midlife and i think there's this expectation that like by the time we arrive here we should have some something figured out that would allow us to have an easier time. Like we should be more skillful, more adult, more mature. And the reality is like we're human, right? At age 20 and at age 40 and at age 60, we're, we're still going to be human and, and intimate relationships are complicated and messy and there's kind of no way around it. There's no like level of skill that you can achieve that makes it clean and simple. It, it, right. They just, that, that's, they're not structured that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not structured that way. <laughs> exactly. So let's um, turn to talking about some of the key issues that arise in the rough patch. Um, and there are a number, I mean, you have chapters on things, you know, from finances to empty nesting to making decisions to stay or go. But I will say that a lot of the chapters at least focus somewhat on sex because sex is such an important part of our marriages and, you know, sexual intimacy is one of the main pathways into deciding on a marital partner. And then it's also one of the areas of intimacy that distinguishes between marriage and other close relationships. But of course, sex changes as our relationships get longer and more committed and more stable. Um, it also changes as we age and it can really contribute to challenges in, in marriage. By midlife, of course, our bodies are evolving and sometimes in ways that we don't desire and, and that impacts our intimate relationships as well as our sense of self as we relate to our partners and vice versa. Our partner's physical changes as they age can impact how we view them sexually. And so I wonder if you can um, talk with us a little bit about what you see as the main challenges for of sexual intimacy during the rough patch. So I think I'd like to start by just saying what I observed in my office, and, and it'd be interesting to hear if it's what you observe in yours. And, um, you know, I mean, often the people who come to see me are, say, in their, you know, um, you know mid-40s, and they've had some kids, and, and um, there is a, at least in heterosexual couples, I see a, a kind of frequent breakdown that has to do with um, them feeling that they have very different avenues to intimacy. That the the that the man feels like um, he's he's you know his wife sort of doesn't have the bandwidth or the interest in being sexual at the level that he does, and that if they were having sex, he would feel close and he would feel um, loved and he would feel all this, uh, you know, work is worth it and, and all that. And she feels, you, you know, all you want is sex. You don't have time to really, uh, be intimate, to be tender, to care about how I'm, my stresses and how I'm feeling all day. And so I can't possibly, uh, muster sexual interest cause that's not how I'm put together. Um, so this can kind of break down into an almost politicized battle, I find, where it's like, you know, people are hurling kind of um, below the belt uh, accusations toward each other. You know, the woman might be all you care about is sex. And, you know, man is like, you're so cold. And, you know, it, it's kind of um, what I try to encourage people to do is is really see this as kind of a shared 
a shared problem where there are two individuals who have different needs to create a sense of intimacy and that it's not as if it's, it's like everything else, right? It's not like one is right and one is wrong, hot potato, you're doing this to me, I'm doing that to you, but more like, okay, so it turns out that for the woman, she actually needs some time to decompress and talk about her stresses in order to feel close and intimate, you know, and maybe we need to arrange things accordingly. Uh, or, you know, is it the worst thing in the world to have sex when it's, you're not totally in the mood just because it's a good thing for the other person? I mean, I think a lot of one thing I'm proud of in this book is I think men and women both feel understood in it. I feel like, um, you know, men are often afraid that women, maybe including women authors, are going to see them as just kind of all about sex. And I think sex is a huge part of marriage. And and part of the reason is, A, if you're trying to be sexually monogamous, that's the place you're having sex. But B, you live with another person. We are animals, you know, and, and to be living with a person and not feel that there's an affectionate, easy flow of, of physical soothing and physical excitement is actually really corrosive, I think, to people's sense of self-esteem, their sense of self-worth, their sense of well-being. And so I feel like it's really um, something that needs to be addressed when it's absent. You know, I mean, unless both people are like, we don't we want this mutually, which is sometimes true. I mean, people agree to have a sexless marriage or find it elsewhere. But if that's not the agreement, then I think people need to really um, grapple with that because the long-term corrosive impact of that being gone or dead or just too tense to uh, be fulfilling is, is, is a big, big problem in this the whole middle slice, middle slice of life. You know, the other thing you brought up is just the sexual changes over time and how people, you know, body changes. I think in my own personal experience, one of the main impediments over a long marriage from the women's side is how incredibly self-critical and self-conscious they become about their bodies. You know, we have such a pervasive sort of, you know, high standard in the culture of how women are supposed to look. Um, but I think women are their own worst self-critics. And my experience, men tend to be much more forgiving if, <laughs> of all that if the women are loving and interested. Um, so I think that can be a huge sort of um, sort of uh, turnoff problem for women. They just don't want to have sex till they have the body they want. Um, but I think over time, you know, obviously it becomes an issue in various ways. And again, you know, men's performance issues when they age and, you know, uh, women's body image issues when they age and all these things. But again, it's all about the same stuff that we're talking about generally, which is how do you navigate change? How do you find that sweet spot of acceptance and constructive effort? You know, where do you, what do you decide you can accept? What do you work on? Um, you know, that's, and how do you collaborate on that? That's all kind of in the mix there as, as life, life progresses. Yeah. Well, and I, it, it's such a great message in the area of sexual intimacy to make it a shared project. And it doesn't, as you're saying, mean that you have to have, see sex exactly the same or want it in exactly the same frequency or intensity or, you know, with creative positions. But as much as you can make it a constructive and shared project, it can be something that brings you together and, and that becomes something that is a, a bonding experience, which is really what we're looking for in the sexual intimacy domain. Because as you're saying, that's a way that we connect to our partners in an important way. Kind of reminds me of the, you know, that classic experiment, Harry Harlow's um, monkeys, right? Two little fake monkeys. One had milk and the other was soft. And the baby monkey was naturally attracted to the softer monkey, right? Because we're animals and we crave touch and physical affection and soothing through touch. And sex is a way that we do that. It's a way that we connect intimately with people that, and it's a way that we feel loved, we feel attractive, we feel cared about, we feel loving, we express our love. And so it is an important area of relationships. And when it goes out the window, it, it can really have a big impact. And there's so much variation that happens as we age into our relationships, as we age individually and as our marriages, 
you know, take on more years. Um, and, you know, seeing it as an opportunity to grow together with your partner, I think can be so helpful. I was just going to add one thing, you know, and I sort of alluded to this, but I want to underscore it. I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking of a couple I see where, you know, he, he basically wants, you know, it's like the Woody Allen movie, <laughs> you know, we have sex three times a week. We hardly ever have sex. We have three times uh, sex, three times a week. We're always having sex. Right. So the guy is like, you know, he wants sex more once or three times a week. The wife's like, I'm a once a week kind of person. And he sees this as a whole, um, rejection and she doesn't love him and you know she's doing this bad thing to him and that's just like every other domain of marriage where how is it possible to have two people who love each other but actually have different desires and does it mean because your desire is genuinely to have sex one time a week that you don't love me right like this stuff can break down just like everything else so I sort of see sex in the context both that it's important to not let drop off the map. It's something that's real and, and in all the ways we've discussed and important, but also to see that people deal with it in all the same dysfunctional ways they deal with everything else. And so, um, partly trying to help people say, no, there's two people here who actually want different things. And it's, it isn't a, a, a clear cut commentary about their motives, yeah. you know, there's complexity in that. So I wonder if you could actually carry that example through. I mean, how do you help a couple? Because I think this is something that I see all the time in my private practice where two partners have really different preferences. And let's just keep for the sake of simplicity, let's talk about frequency. So one couple, one partner wants it, as you're suggesting, three times a week. The other wants it one time a week. How do you help couples negotiate that difference in a way that is respectful but that sort of keeps them moving forward in a constructive way. Right. So the, the first issue there is to help them not have black and white thinking about, uh, you know, if this is happening, you love me. And if this is happening, you don't. I mean, that's just a box that is not going to help anybody. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't explore and respect the fact that they feel that way. Right. I mean, what does it mean to you? What, you know, why do you feel that if she feels this different way, you're unloved. Well, maybe it's, you know, I'm so frustrated and I'm in such pain that if she really cared about me, you know, she would just do it anyway or whatever. Um, or if she really, I can't imagine even being her. Like if, if you know, maybe it's a, 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 a lack of empathy. Maybe it's, you know, not being able to think, how would it be to be a person who wasn't just like me in my body, you know, feeling a different way? Um, so there's that part of it. And then there's also, you know, coping with disappointment, you know, not catastrophizing from disappointment. In other words, yes, it's too bad. <laughs> you know, you wish you were more like you or you wish you were more like you. <clears throat> but that doesn't that's not that's not that's life's full of that. Right. And you have to be able to manage that and not get retaliatory or vindictive or start thinking the other person's doing something terrible to you. Because the minute you're in that mindset, then they feel erased. They feel like what they need isn't valid, valued. I think for, um, for the, the person who wants less sex, the, the difficulty there is that if I, if I try, if I go through the motions and do what you want me to do, I'll become more alienated and, and more detached and just be sort of placating you. And then that's its own problem. But I think there's a lot of benefit in for that person to be thinking, wait a sec, here's someone I love and they want something different from me. And is there some way I could move toward them? Can I compromise without seeing it as some kind of violation of my being? You know, I mean, the good thing about married sex is, and I think the studies show that people who are married have more sex than other people. It's because they live together and they have the opportunity. And so, you know, the good thing about married sex is sometimes it can be deeply intimate. Sometimes it can be just sort of quick and hot. Sometimes it can be kind of bored. Sometimes it can be kind of sleepy. Like every, you know, not that much rides on each instance if you have a, a generally generous and flexible outlook. And so, you know, I, I never think it's a good idea for someone to go through the motions and start detaching because that's just going to result in a bad experience for them and for the other person. But I also think there's got to be some give and take and some kind of compromise and some humor. Humor, humor is huge. <laughs> Absolutely. And 
you just you talk about this a bit in your book, you know, that there can be more flexibility in the way that we think about sex. I mean, first of all, I think in our culture, we have this idea of like, you know, it, it, a very black and white idea about sex, like we're either ready to go or we're not. But there's actually a lot of gray area that you can feel desire without feeling arousal and or you can not feel any desire or arousal and be willing to get in the mood and explore with your partner that there's a lot of gray area. And if you're feeling in a place where you can be generous and willing to explore and also willing to either be disappointed or to disappoint that there, it just opens up a lot more opportunities. And as you're saying in married life, we have a lot of opportunities to, to have those explorations and to say, you know, if this one experience doesn't go particularly well, like it's okay. Cause you know, we're going to be together for a whole lot longer. Um, the other thing that I wanted to have a, quickly discuss with you is this idea that um, there's lots of different arousal methods and that we sort of default to partner interaction, but that, you know, there are other ways to have sexual uh, connection or sexual gratification that don't require partner interaction. And you talk about that a little bit in your book as well. Yeah, so that idea came from Barry McCarthy, who I think is a good resource for your listeners. Um, and he's a sex therapist, and he talks about um, in, 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 in sort of, well, I'll get into the arousal patterns in a moment, but I think one thing that relates to what you just said is he said, if, if you're being engaged in your sex life, that there's going to be he, he loves using percentages and I can't remember what he said, but maybe like 20% failures. Like in other words, that if you're pushing the envelope, you're going to have situations that are ridiculous or unsatisfying or, you know, failures. And so in a way you should expect that and not be sort of, um, you know, an anxious perfectionist about things. Um, he also says a really interesting thing that um, when sex is going badly for a couple, it accounts for something like 80% of their dissatisfaction in the relationship. But when it's going well, it accounts for about 20% of their satisfaction. So in a <laughs> picture of the, the more it's not happening or going badly, the more large it looms in people's minds. But if it's okay, then it sort of recedes uh, as one, one nice source among others of connection. Yeah. Yeah. People, which is a useful thought. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem, and a lot of people have written about this, Dean Kerner and Emily McCoskey and various people, you know, when you're in a long-term relationship, <clears throat> we don't have that experience you have when you're first with someone. We're just being around them, you know, elicits arousal and desire. You have to actually create the context to experience it. And so you know, if you're walking around, you know, just going through life next to your partner, it's quite possible. I mean, it's nice that if you might catch their eye and feel aroused, you know, but it's quite possible you're kind of not thinking in that way, you know, as you're going through life. And so that that comes into this thing couples argue about, about sex should be spontaneous versus sex should be planned and scheduled, right? But the idea there is like, maybe we have to create the context in which arousal can take place. Right. So so maybe we do have to schedule it and have anticipation and look forward to it. Or maybe we do have to go out and actually try new things, get toys or figure out new venues or whatever. In other words, we have to. And I talk in my third chapter, which is called Feeling Close and Love and Sex. I talk about my my sort of definition of maturity, which is um, caretaking your own tender, vulnerable emotions, the ability to feel with and think about yourself. And similarly with sex, um, sort of working on sex, which everybody's like, Oh, what a horrible, depressing idea. Working on sex is working to create the conditions in which you will be aroused and excited and, um, desiring. So you might have to say we're going away for the weekend or we're going to take the afternoon off or we're going to browse the sex shop or we're going to do something to make this happen. And that's the kind of commitment that I think people are often very embarrassed and inhibited about making. You know, they sort of think sex should just happen because they have all sorts of conflicted feelings about wanting it or desiring it or looking too horny or something. When in fact, like that's a really important skill to develop to say, of course I need this. I'm a person, you know, and like, let's, let's be, this is the one person I can be unashamed about this with. 
so we had been talking about the different ways that we can enter into sex and, and some of the gray areas. And one of the things that you had mentioned, which is this idea that Barry McCarthy has that, you know, we should expect that 20% of our sexually intimate encounters are, are not so great, or maybe even downright terrible, is just that another colleague of mine, who's also a couples therapy specialist, um, had this great line of, to have great sex, you have to be willing to have mediocre sex. And I think that's true for so many areas of marriage, that the burden that we place on ourselves about things going smoothly and feeling good all the time really does as a disservice because most of the things that you know are going on in our marriages are complicated and you know we're going to have a rough day and not bring our best selves or our partner's going to have a rough day and not bring their best selves and so if we can just approach most of our interactions including our sexual life with our partner in this with this perspective of and that it's okay if things don't go well, because the beauty of having a long marital life is that things cannot go well today, and we can try again tomorrow, or we can learn from it and grow from it, or laugh about it, as you were saying, that it can really decrease the burden and make the good times a lot more accessible. Right. I mean, people do shy away from, um, you know, less smooth experiences often because they're scary because they don't know where the bottom is <laughs> you know if things go down they feel uh insecure i mean you know all sorts of reasons that people try to keep a sort of um steady kind of status quo but the cost is often deadness right and and detachment and so you know i was just seeing a couple yesterday that's been in this incredibly sort of frozen uh, standoff for just decades with each other and the wife who tends to be the more sort of reticent and kind of tucked in kind of, um, less emotive, expressive partner in this couple was saying that she noticed since they started couple therapy, that she's kind of feeling more and saying more, you know, and I was seeing privately thinking of this to myself as a real positive progression for her that she's willing to to be more out there with the mess of it you know in a way that um it's sometimes hard for people to just be in that place right of a strong emotion or uncertainty or conflict but but i think that is where the liveliness is too the life the vitality the real emotion so like you're saying to get to be able to accept that and almost embrace it is a plus yeah yeah. I mean, it's so consistent with, um, I think this is true about many therapeutic approaches, but in acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a, an approach that I practice, there's real emphasis on being willing to experience the full gamut of human emotions. And if you're unwilling to experience some of the more uncomfortable emotions, it makes it much harder to fully experience the, the more f fun ones. And that's true in marriage, right? If we can't sort of be willing to get into the messiness of some of the things that crop up between us and our partners, it's a lot more challenging to enjoy the good times with our partners and to really feel connected as we go through life with them. Like if you're totally avoiding conflict at all costs, there's huge cost to that, right? But there's also cost to having terrible scarring fights, right? So the question is, how do you, how do you do conflict in a way that actually enhances or allows you to be more alive and engaged that's 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 a challenge yeah yeah and i th and and your book really gives a lot of very wise tips for how to do that right and i think you know the feeling with and thinking about the developing a shared story the um willingness to sort of make space for your partner's perspective you know that lives right beside your own all of those kinds of skills and and sort of abilities are really part and parcel of being able to have conflict in a way that's constructive and and gets you to a place of being more connected and and traveling the path of marriage you know more joyously even if it's uncomfortable right and i think the idea of acceptance that you were just alluding to is so crucial to directing toward oneself right as well because i think sometimes people think um they need to be consistent you know they need to be have their arguments be airtight you know they can't contradict themselves and the fact is that we're all completely self-contradictory <laughs> conflicted beings and you know i'll notice if i'm 
you know, in a fight with my husband and I'm so completely convinced of my point of view and I'm there stewing and then an hour or two will pass and I'll just start wanting to be with him again. You know, I'll be wanting to be close. I'll be like, you know, and the, the thing I was mad at is sort of dying down and I just don't want to be in a fight, you know, and, and you could imagine thinking, well, I can't possibly do that. That's weak. I need to stick with my point of view and argue it into the ground. And, you know, those fluctuations and those just ups and downs, like accepting in yourself that you're going to feel different things at different times. And that's OK, I think is is actually helpful. Absolutely. There was actually an interview that I did with an evolutionary psychologist, Stephen Stewart Williams, a while back. And one of my favorite lines from his book was something to the effect of that we are, human beings are conflicted animals. And that's because it's what we've evolved to be. And I think that's so true. And I, and having a more accepting stance of yourself as being a conflicted person with highs, high highs and low lows and changing perspectives can really help you to embrace that and not sort of get too rigid with, within mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so that gives me a little bit of an opportunity to transition us to fantasies and crushes, which is one of the topics in, in the rough patch. One thing that's so common in midlife marriages is that we um, stay human, but th- our focus is on a, a single monogamous relationship. And as normal, natural human beings, we might have fantasies or crushes as we encounter people in the world. And it's an it's an interesting sort of dilemma because we do have this impression that marriage means we focus exclusively our romantic and sexual desires on one person. But the human mind can be conflicted and can sort of, you know, daydream or or fantasize about other people. And so so I'm curious, do you think, is this a problem of one having the fantasy? Is it a sign of a marital problem or is it something else entirely? Right. So in the book, I have a chapter. I I talk about sex and attraction and so forth throughout the book. But there's a chapter called Love Sickness where I talk about a woman who really kind of falls in love with somebody outside her marriage, even though she's very happily married. Um, Because I do think this is a phenomenon that really doesn't get much uh, subtle or exploration or attention and yet is quite common. And so I felt it was a kind of contribution to try to map some of this out. I mean, I think generally the, the, the dilemma that we all face, and I talk about this in the affairs chapter is in order to keep, um, I might call it your sexual fuel tank full. You have to be aware and open to the world. I mean, you have to be open to sensations in yourself. You have to be open to things that you see and that are, you know, interesting or or exciting. And that is kind of how we fill ourselves up and feel alive, right? And if we're busily trying to never feel anything toward anyone except our partner in bed at 10 o'clock at night, you know, there's a certain kind of constriction that's involved in that that is probably not going to fuel excitement in the marital bed. And so how do you navigate this balancing act of staying sort of maximally open and yet boundaried? And that is really a lifelong project. You know, that's not something that any of us is particularly trained to do well. Now, you know, if, if your marriage is basically good and you're an alive person, there are going to be people who cross your path or things that interest you. And I think people get extraordinarily guilty and alarmed by that. And so they feel like they're doing something terribly wrong. And as you know, we all know, the more you sort of um, uh, get guilty and ashamed about these things, the more energy they're going to suck up. So on the most sort of basic level, it seems to me that people need to have a certain kind of acceptance and even, um, you know, pleasure in, in just kind of being open and seeing that there's going to be things that cross their path. And the question, it's like, med- it's like mindfulness meditation. Can you let go? <laughs> Can you enjoy it? Let it pass through the system and let go. Now, some people, and sometimes people can't let go. And I think there's a lot of complicated reasons for that. But I think most of them have to do with a loss in some way. And here's what I mean by that. I have been so struck with how many people I have seen in the course of my work who are happy in their relationship and yet experience some big loss, either their parent dies or maybe their partner has a cancer scare or something happens 
and they are pitched into some kind of infatuation with somebody that they totally don't understand. It's like it came out of the clear blue sky. And I think that this is very primal and I'm fascinated with it. I'd love to write a paper about it. I don't fully understand it. I talk about it some in the book. But that's an example of something where you may have some unbidden, unexpected infatuation that seems to come out of the blue that's due to something like a loss. And that does seem to happen to people. Um, Another thing is um, in the chapter, the woman that I profile Her son, and this is related, but her son has this terrible health scare and her husband's away and she gets this sort of odd infatuation with a neighbor. And um, I think, again, that's like this horrible shock to her system, which really primed her to sort of look into the environment for something to save her, a kind of lifeline. And then it took on a kind of life of its own, which I talk about in terms of um, a bunch of different psychological ideas. But I think in her case had to do with a certain kind of relationships in her family of origin. Her father had an affair and, you know, the kind of mother she had. And so there's all this complexity to this stuff. And I think people are also put together differently. I think some people are more um, seeking of kind of romance as a way to cope with um, life. And other people aren't. And sometimes you have marriages between somebody who is sort of like that and someone who isn't, and then they feel very judged by the other person. They can't possibly tell them. And what I talk about in the chapter, and I also talk about in a recent article I wrote for Parents Magazine about having crushes, is I think people should explore the possibility of talking to their partners about this before it, before it gets too, takes on a life of its own. And I know that that isn't a natural thing for us to think in terms of, you know, people do generally have strong feelings about their partners having (laughs) crushes and so forth. But at the same time, life is long and we should understand that people are going to have, you know, problems in this area. It's just sort of sometimes happens and there should be a vocabulary for that. You know, there should be a, a, a way that we learn that we can, because I trust you and love you and you're my person, and I'm going through this. I want to tell you this, but I, I'm telling you it because I don't want it to become more important than it is. And I feel kind of weird having these feelings and not being able to tell you. I mean, that all seems like a pretty messy conversation, but how much better that is than, you know, a year later, hey, I'm leaving. I'm not happy. Right. I mean, yes. so there's like something in that that I think kind of as therapists and as people and as a culture, we should develop a language for that kind of thing. Yeah. There's two things that come to mind as you're talking. One is Brene Brown's work about shame. And she talks a lot about how the things that we're most ashamed of, we tend to hide in a closet, which just happens to be the best breeding ground for those things that we're ashamed of to grow in emotional potency. And that the cure is to bring them out into the light, kind of what you're talking about, which can be terrifying and incredibly uncomfortable. But that if we want to be more effective in managing and and not having them sort of overtake everything, that that is the solution, is to sort of bring it out into the light and talk about it, give it air. Air is what prevents it, those things from growing and sort of taking over. The other thing that it really reminds me of is a lot of Esther, Esther Perel's work. Um, you know, the, her book, Mating in Captivity, talks a lot about how it's, it's just really normal to have different, you know, thoughts and feelings as sexual beings out in the world and that we can choose to have monogamous relationships, but we can't choose not to have normal human brains. And, and by accepting them and, and sort of recognizing ourselves for what we are, which is animals that sort of, as you're saying, like go through the world and encounter things and have experiences and connect to things and, you know, whose past sometimes enter into our present in unexpected and sometimes even unexplainable ways. If we can just accept that without so much fear, um, it opens us up more to make very intentional choices as opposed to being driven by fear or, or by, you know, negative or uncomfortable emotion. And so I think having like a more open uh, stance towards having fantasies or having crushes, even when you're married and not making so much of it, I think is really freeing. So you can be married in midlife and, and find somebody outside of your marriage interesting or very attractive and, and make a choice to stay, to remain committed in your marriage. And, and, and 
that's great. And I, as you're saying, if you can talk about that with your partner and have that be a bridge to to moving on or, or to becoming even closer with your with your spouse, that can be wonderful too, even if it is uncomfortable in the process. Yeah, I'll just say one other thing about that too, in terms of this idea of fantasy. You know, there's a distinction that uh, uh, one writer made between secrecy and privacy. And, you know, part of fantasy and partly part of being an individual, which is what I'm talking about in this book, is having the freedom of your own mind. You know, that you have a private mind that you don't owe uh, spilling the contents to your partner about necessarily. But there's a difference between private thought, like I'm going through my day and seeing people and having fantasies, and that's my private little playground in my mind. And when does that turn into secrecy, that I'm keeping my partner out in some way that's damaging? And that's a really important distinction to make, that you need to have a private mind um, in order to be a person. (laughs) But if you're keeping secrets, that becomes a whole other thing. And people have different ideas about what constitutes one or the other. But I think that um, one of the things I talk about is if you're finding that, you know, some some idea or some person or some fantasy is sort of taking on a life of its own and you're starting to tell a story about it and it's becoming this significant emotional relationship in your mind, that's the point at which something may be moving into kind of I'm keeping this as a secret. So again, there's a, this whole kind of, balancing act there of, you know, are you feeling that what you're basically playing with in your mind is essentially harmless? And at what point does it seem like it's becoming harmful? And that could not, that could be something that's not something you actually did in the world. Like I flirted with so-and-so or I kissed so-and-so. It could be just what's happening in your mind. Like I'm getting sort of preoccupied in a way that's not healthy here. And I need to let you know. And, and just to say, you know, if you can have that hard conversation about this thing that makes you ashamed, there is the chance that it does deepen your bond with somebody, right? Like you're, you're really able to see each other in your humanity. Maybe they don't have a great reaction at first, but maybe, you know, it reminds you how much you need each other. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that can go. That's actually very deepening. I've been fascinated with these stories and I tell one in my book, but I've heard it anecdotally from other people where there's been an affair. And then the couple is like, the, the married couple where the affair happened is newly passionate about each other, right? It, it's like, these are very complex, profound, weird things that go on between people, right? Like they're awakened in a way toward each other. That they would never have asked for, right? With this affair. But so there's ways in which talking about these things can actually make people more intimate in a way. Yeah. I mean, not always. It can derail. There's all sorts of dangers and risks, but I think there's a hope there too. Yeah. I do a lot of affairs work in my private practice and and I don't know the research on it, but anecdotally uh, uh, or just in my clinical experience, I've actually witnessed that a lot, that once an affair gets discovered or disclosed, that there is this sort of resurgence of passion between the married couple um, and, and it is, it's, it's this really surprising, complicated thing. And, and our relationships with our partners are just, they're deeply complicated and messy and fascinating. And I think seeing that as an opportunity to learn and grow in yourself and with your partner is, is such a, it's such a gift. And I think ultimately you summarize in your book that the rough patch can really be harnessed for good if we use it to become more of the kind of person we want to be if we learn to make room for our partner's experiences in addition to our own, if we take the time and the energy to learn to express our emotions more skillfully, develop a nuanced relationship with our fantasy lives, and discover the need for committed living where values prevail over emotions, that it really can be a gift for us and for our marriages. That's the hope. Well, I think your book does a great job of helping couples, individuals within marriages to learn a lot of these skills, to to develop a lot of those perspectives and to take that journey more skillfully. So we'll definitely link to your book and um, I'll link to some of Daphne's articles and uh, to some of her uh, other interviews. Um, But I definitely recommend those of you who are interested in learning more about how to get through the rough patch and how to learn the fine art of being
being married and living together with your partner um, to check out her wonderful book. And Daphne will be back on to talk about her other wonderful book, Maternal Desire on Children, Love, and the Inner Life. So we'll, we'll look forward to having her back on. Thank you so much, Daphne, for joining us today. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com.